can't play hardball for 23 years and not pick up some bruises. For Chris Matthews, they're black and blue badges of honor, and so are the ones he inflicted, most of them anyway. Tonight for the hour, Chris Matthews with a brand new bestseller and some pent up opinions on his favorite subject, politics. Hello and welcome to Banfield. Every political journalist I know would benefit from a campaign of his or her own, or a year or two of working for the people who work for the people, and vice versa. Politicians learn a lot when they step out on the other side of the microphone. So maybe that explains why Chris Matthews, uh, before he talked the talk, was walking the walk. And by the way, he walked with giants. And he flew with presidents. And when he decided to cover them, he knew when they were giving it to him straight, and more often, when they weren't. For almost a quarter of a century, Matthews anchored Hardball on MSNBC, a show that no Politico would miss and no politician could afford to miss. Off camera, he wrote, and he still writes, bestseller after bestseller, about his heroes, his passions, and now his whole darn life. Chris Matthews, uh, great to have you. It's nice to see you. How are you? Nice to meet you. There you are. There you are. There I Good am. And by you. the way, big disclaimer, we are old friends. We worked together from 1999 till about 2004. And so um, I feel like I, I know you as a friend. And then I also feel like I know you as a fan because I also was among those journalists and politicos who would watch you as appointment viewing. Do you miss doing hardball? Well, yeah, of course. I, uh, I'm somewhat uh, sentimental about it sometimes. I meet people that come up to me and say very nice things. Uh, of course, if they don't like it, they don't say anything. But the ones who do like me, who tend to be of my age, generally, um, of different backgrounds, you know, black and white and men and women, but I really feel like I've missed them. Uh, they miss me. Uh, I think 20-some uh, years, I mean, 26 all together every evening. I never really saw the sun go down, actually. I have noticed there's an experience that's called the sun going down between 5 and 7, and you really actually enjoy that time of day in a way that I never managed to do so. I was always on TV. And by the way, I hate to break it to everybody, but the exciting things in your life don't happen on television. They generally uh, happen when you're out reporting a story or you're out working in politics and you're actually behind the scenes and doing, you know, historic stuff, involved with historic moments at least. And, uh, and that's what my book's about. Well, missing the sun going down, I mean, no one ever said you get into television for the, uh, for the hours or for the job security, right? <laughs> The job here is not always there, but uh, it was pretty good. I mean, I, uh, I was on a long time, and uh, I'm 25 years old right now, and I, uh, how long can you go? I mean, my wife Kathleen says, don't go till you have to, don't go till you don't really be able to make sense on the air. I think I can still make sense. Yeah, we are you know, you had a tiny bit of dropout. It was right when you said your age. So I got to repeat it, not because I'm being, you know, a bully, <laughs> but because it's a bit, uh, you know, flummoxing that you're 75 years old. You, you look great. You sound great. You, I don't think that, um, that you were ready to leave television. And by the looks on the folks on the back of your, of your book, um, listen, Andrea Mitchell, big supporter, Douglas Brinkley, John Meacham, Joy Reid, Mika Brzezinski had great things to say about you. A lot of people had great things to say about you, not just with the book, but after you left Hardball. Right. I, I want to sort of dig into your psyche about sort of the, the whole cancel culture, how you went out. Uh, it's a long conversation, but just sort of the off the top, sure, your, your reaction to the, the reaction. Uh, I think some stories are simple, and mine are very simple. I was on, I guess I had the uh, celebration of uh, 20 years of anniversary of uh, Hardball late in uh, 19, or rather late 19, and then in 20, I started covering the uh, campaign. I was down in uh, Charleston on February 28th. A story ran that I uh, commented about someone's appearance in the makeup chair sitting next to me, uh, and uh, you're not supposed to do that, and the next day, I. I retired from MSNBC that Saturday the 29th. So it's pretty, you know, cut and dried. I did something wrong. I admitted it. I didn't argue about it. I said, yeah, I, I, that sounds like me talking. It sounds like I did that. In fact, I remember doing it. And uh, why I did it, you can figure. But I did. 
and I decided not to get into a mite, uh, he said mite, or she said, one of that thing kind of thing. I didn't say it right. And, uh, and I left and uh, I walked away. So that, that's her. That's Laura Bassett there, the one who, who had the complaint about um, the, the comment. And I, I want to play the moment from complaint. that I think, day. I, I think it's over, by the way. I think uh, she reported accurately. I think it had an impact, impact on everybody, me especially, I guess. And, and I think that's the story in itself and all together. Well, you certainly weren't shy. You were. Uh, it was a real mea culpa the day that you went on the air, Chris, and and you shocked everybody. I mean, you shocked everybody at MSNBC. I was watching live. I remember it at the time, and I just want to play that moment where you went on the air and, and basically said goodbye. I'm done. I'm out. I'll see you later. Uh, it, it was short and sweet. And let, let's play, it and we'll talk on the other side. Take a peek. After conversation with MSNBC, I decided tonight will be my last hardball. So let me tell you why. The younger generations out there are ready to take the reins. We see them in politics, in the media, in fighting for their causes. They are improving the workplace. We're talking here about better standards than we grew up with, fair standards. A lot of it has to do with how we talk to each other. Compliments on a woman's appearance that some men, including me, might have once incorrectly thought were okay. We're never okay. Not then and certainly not today. And for making such comments in the past, I'm sorry. So listen, Chris, uh, and then you were gone. I mean, you went to commercial break and Steve Kornacki came back and, and was bewildered uh, by it. I'm still trying to figure out where we are um, as people. Are we, um, are, we, are we human? Are we benevolent? Are we willing to forgive and forget and move forward and be better? Or are we just prone to punish? Well, I feel like you. I know how you feel about it, but w I mean, since you've been through this last year, tell yeah. me. I think you're guessing. You're a friend of mine, and you're guessing, and I appreciate sympathy where it's at. I'll take any sympathy. But the fact is, my wife was an anchor woman in Channel 7 in, in Washington, D.C., for ABC for 15 years. She knew all about the culture of, of television and, and the need for gender equality and pay equality and everything. And um, I understood it. I always made sure that my Sunday show, for example, which I had really much control over, a lot of control over, in fact, it was my show, I said, every episode, every Sunday, we'll have two men and two women, even Steven. And we had a pretty good diversity, I think. And then I did the same thing with my top producers, the executive producer who puts the show together. I, it's Tammy Haddad, it's Ann Clank, it's now the great uh, Tina Urbanski. I put them in because they were great. And I, 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 I supported them. They were my, my bosses in the sense of a day-to-day -day running the show. And so I, where I screwed up, if you will, is when I still uh, continue on occasion to compliment a person on their appearance. If you can say comment, remark on whatever verb you choose, but I wasn't supposed to do it, I shouldn't do it. And let's face it, it's not fair. And that's one reason not to do it. It's not fair to be walking around judging people's appearance. It's got, they don't have much choice about their appearance. We don't have much choice about ours. And it's just unfair. So I think uh, I got caught and I uh, took, the, took the punishment. I, I left the show. So there's nothing Let me ask really this. to and talk about this, I, and I was hoping we could talk about my 70 years of covering politics and being interested in it, like covering the Berlin Wall coming down in South African elections for all races. We and are. In the back you room have a whole the hour. Meal. I am doing I'm so much. I'm giving you a whole hour. But I'll tell you, I'm... Uh, it. it was the end. One of the... It wasn't the whole. Yeah, no, I think one of the reasons I'm I'm so interested in talking to you about it is because I've been working in criminal justice for 15 years since I, um, you know, got the boot from NBC. And I found a whole new area area um, that I learned from. And you were right about the war. Wait, what's that? You were right about the war. You were right about the Iraq war. And now everybody agrees. Yeah. You were I, I sure think so. I, I really think I was right about the Iraq war, and, and you're right. It became de rigueur uh, much later after NBC found it unpalatable, but here I am. So the reason I wanted to say this to you, uh, Chris, is because a lot of my career now has based, you know, on the criminal justice system, which at its core is about mens rea, which is what's in your heart, what's in your soul, what do you, you know, if you have an infraction, did you really intend for it to be? I know you. I know who you are. I know what kind of person you are. I had a great relationship with you. I always felt that in your heart, you always meant very well to people. And I wonder if you just feel as though, you know, you were written about differently, you were treated differently, and, and, and you were dismissed as though you did not have uh, good intentions in whatever your actions, rightly or wrongly, may have been. Well, you know, I think uh, 
I'm trying to be, I don't want to defend myself because it's, it's all over. I mean, what happened happened yeah. and it had consequences of, you know, I was reading a, one of my favorite new books is West with the Night by Burl Markham. You know, she's the woman pilot, the feminist back in the 30s, I guess. And Hemingway said she was a better writer than he was, which is pretty amazing for him to admit that. And she wrote this wonderful line. You know, I'm an underliner when I read books and I was, I'm coming in through this quote. And then she says, um, I can never tell the difference between an impulse and an inspiration. And the only way I know the difference is in the consequences. So if it turns out you said the wrong thing, uh, you learn, learn that. If you said something brilliant, well, it was just as impulsive, but it had to be brilliant. In this case, it was uh, it was impulsive, but it was wrong. You know, just, just saying to somebody sitting next to you in the makeup chair, uh, you know, something about her being good looking or something is, uh, is not appropriate in the workplace today. I mean, we can say this a hundred times. I mean, I don't know how many times we go around this, uh, Ashley, but that's the fact. It's not defensible. Yep. It's wrong. I've said this in every interview that's come up this last couple of weeks, and I, I'll say it again. I mean, there's no, uh, there's no way around accepting the fact that I said it and I had to pay the consequences. And I did. So I'm an underliner too. Um, and as I was reading your book, I underlined a couple things. Um, that's a good you know, book I, I love. Is that a great book? <laughs> is, that, is that a pretty handsome book? Is that how I feel? I like <laughs> you don't want a dog in the fight, do you? Cover, it's got that sort of, uh, what do you call it, the mat, the mat cover. And I and, yep. and also jagged edges. I like the jagged edges. So I asked for all that. They were in the specs. So this this picture of you, is this the vanity picture of you? Because I always pick well, pictures um, from like at least 10 know, years it's, earlier. <laughs> it's fascinating because I'm a little Irish, okay? So a when little. I left, the Washington, the Washington Post ran that on the style page, you know, like the era of Chris Mathis is over. But I remember the picture and I did save the clip. And so four o'clock in the morning, a few months ago, they were trying to put some picture of me. I thought it was really a terrible picture on the cover of what I just, they were just not there. I don't know why they did. They wanted to put it on. I go four o'clock in the morning. I got up, I got out of bed, went over to my office in the house and I found that cover picture. And I said, okay, buddy, I'm putting the picture on the cover of the book that ran when I left the show. So, <laughs> I like it. I'm very pensive. I'm in front of the White House. It's obviously on a TV set. And I'm looking at the world, basically. I thought it was a right, right kind of picture. It's very clever. And, you know, so I want to just say to that, um, you have a lot of fans. You, you left the show. You have a lot of fans uh, that continue to be your fans. Bill Maher, uh, one of them, and had some pretty choice words about you leaving and no longer being in that, I, that I slot. Disagree. Let me just play one. my what, friend, but I disagree with because I was wrong. Well, let me let me play let me play the soundbite because I'm going to move. I don't want you to repeat the same thing over, but, but uh, I do want to play his soundbite because it talks to cancel culture in general, which you know is now a uh, political football. So let me play Bill's soundbite. Ask you about it on the other side. Sure. MSNBC used to run this thing. This is the this is who we are. Well, I didn't like who you were this week, right. and I don't think a lot of people who work there like this either. And I think this cancel culture is a cancer on progressivism. So, Chris, the question out of this is the story of cancel culture is not uh, liberal and it's not conservative. Both parties are doing it. Both parties are using it. The latest one this week is Ellie Kemper, a hysterical comedian, terribly talented. You probably know her from The Office, but the unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. Somebody, you know, grabbed a photo from, I think, you know, 20 years ago when she was 19 years old and she had gone to a, a, a veiled profit party in St. Louis. This is 20 years after the organization had righted its ways of not allowing Jewish people or black people into the organization. And, you know, she was, I don't know, crowned uh, with some fancy crown at, at a party. And here we are, you know, society's given her the death sentence. And that's what we do now. We decide retroactively sometimes to give people the death sentence rather than having a conversation about where we can change. And I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Well, I don't want to, you know, I, I've accepted uh, the judgment of my network. I knew the situation I put them in. And so I'm not going to question that. They were, I was basically had to decide whether I want to let them take some action against me. I'm not sure what it was going to be. I don't think I was getting fired or anything, but I don't know. Um, and I wanted to, uh, to make the judgment myself and leave on my own steam, if you will. And I decided that it's getting close to retirement, I guess. Well, I didn't really feel like retiring. And uh, I made the decision. So uh, I don't know. Everybody's. I do, I do think you have to judge each case on its own merits and its own appropriate response and whatever sanction there is, I guess you have to look at it. But I'm, I'm, I'm living with mine. I, I'm not asking for a, a reconsideration, a review of, my, of their judgment. I, 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 
You know, nobody's nobody's entitled to a show on television or radio. It's not everyone has a right to it. You have a right to free speech, of course, but uh, not to a show. I'll never have a show again. I don't think so. And um, that was the price I paid for a flippant remark, a set of remarks. I accept it. Like I said, I'm, like I said, I though, it's, a, it's the death else. sentence. I, yeah. I'm not so sure that I accept it. I'm not so sure that I accept the death sentence for people um, across this country, uh, left and right. Well, okay. uh, this continues well, okay. to happen. I'm not dead. What's that? I'm not dead. <laughs> this is a live TV. <laughs> not... um, this is me. <laughs> I, uh, you're only I, resting. You're I'm not dead yet. You're only resting. I know because you're broadcasting and news analysis to try to make me into a uh, a case. To me, I'm not a case. I'm a person. And I live with, I've had so many good breaks in my life. I mean, really. I'm with the, I'm with you. If actually, you Chris. Book, if we get to the uh, book, we no, can actually I, I, get someone, but We're getting I mean, to the book. I, I, I just want to say you're not... The, the point that you just made is the point. You're a person, not a case. And I think too many people were treating like cases and, and not people. Okay, to your book. Uh, when we come back after the break, we're going to dig way, way, way deep and go way, way, way back to a simpler time, Chris, when political rivals could fight tooth and nail, doing business during business hours, and then bend an elbow together at night. You lived through this. You worked through this. You know all those players. I want you to take me back into those stories and tell me why we can't be that way now. Fresh off getting the vegan leather boot at MSNBC for the high crime of giving a girl a compliment, I'd like to welcome our newest Fox News anchor, Chris Matthews. <laughs> Welcome back to Harbaugh. I'm Chris Matthews. Tonight, my guest is Laura, a spooky blonde lady who lies to the elderly. Ha! <laughs> Chris, I always felt like if you make it on SNL, you've really made it. Um, but the truth oh, is, you made it guy. because... No, I was a good guy. What? I've got to know him. He's a good guy. I'm glad he could do me. He does me very well. And uh, what can I say? You know? Uh, Daryl Hammond, always oh, masterful. Uh, he did great. Y you made it... Um, well before SNL, because you'd worked with everyone. I mean, you named the political giant in Washington. You were either writing speeches for him or you were chief of staff, Tip O'Neill and the rest. I, I want you to take me back to those days and tell me, are they over forever where, where people got along in, uh, in Congress, they got along uh, among party lines, and they were able to see each other as human instead of enemies. Is that gone forever? Well, yeah, I think um, a lot of it uh, is gone right now. And uh, a lot of it, I chalk it up to money, again, in politics, that people who give big chunks of money to politicians, I uh, think they're buying the friendship. I mean, friendship of that politician. And they don't like seeing them hanging around socially with the other side because they were, why did I give this guy, a woman, $50,000 of my life? Why did I raise millions for this person to be my friend? And now I see them powing around with the other side. How come she does or he does that? I'm dead serious about this. They think politics is a social connection that they've made, of these contributors. They, they don't want to be seen being friends. In the old days, Tip O'Neill, my boss, would play golf with Jerry Jerry Ford and Bob Michael, the Republican leader, and Sil Conti, the Republican from Massachusetts, they were open about it. They were friends with each other. There was George Bush Sr. was a friend of Tip O'Neill's. Rostin Kowski was a friend of, of Bush's. These were pals, and they didn't mind being seen together like this with Reagan and Tip. You're not going to see that today. Try to find a picture of them friendly to each other. And I think it's because they go to their contributors and say, give me huge amounts of money, commit yourself to me as a human being, and I'll be your friend. It's, to me, a little odd and strange. It's not democratic at all. It's not about one person, one vote. And that's changed. And used to have another big change, uh, Ashley, is that in the old days, the Democrats would serve in office like the White House for 20 years. They'd bring in the Republicans, Eisenhower, to sort of clean things up for a while. Then they'll give the Democrats another chance. Then the Republicans will come in with like relief pitchers of baseball. And then they'd bring in the Democrats again. The old way was each party kept the other party honest. If they caught some cor uh, corruption on the other side, they'd point it out, they'd indict, or whatever they do, raise hell about it, and then get into power. Today, it's the opposite. Now politicians try to make sure the other side doesn't succeed. 
In other words, they're not trying to keep the other side being corrupt or fail. They want to make sure they fail. And so you see today Mitch McConnell, he's in the opposition party. His job, as he th- sees it, is to make sure nothing gets done, nothing. Voting rights, immigration reform, police reform, nothing gets done by this president so that the Republicans can come back in power in 2022 in the midterm elections. That's how bad it's gotten. It's totally destructive. It's uh, scorched earth, whatever you want to call it. It's not about competing with each other to do a good job. It's not like that. So what's odd about that is that these are not all a whole new, not all a whole new batch of folks. Mitch McConnell's been around the block. He's been around as long as you have. And so this would be a different version of Mitch McConnell if what you're saying is this is an evolution. Let me let me show something from President Reagan's speech. Uh, it was a tribute to Tip O'Neill on St. Patrick's Day in 1986. There's a reason I want to show that. I got a question for you. Bob Hope was we'll there. say again? Bob, Bob Hope, Hope was there? Yep, he was there. It was a big <laughs> night. Okay, so let me play that. I want to ask you something about it on the other side. Take a look. To be honest, I've always known the tip was behind me. <laughs> even, even it was only at the State of the Union address. As I made each proposal, I could hear Tip whispering to the George Bush, forget it, no way. <laughs> Fat chance. So political rivals, you know, having a a fun time. And the truth was, it wasn't fat chance. They actually did get a lot done. But when you say it's all about the donors, I'm still I'm still honestly curious. And I don't know that I agree. I think maybe a lot of it is about the donors, but I think a lot of it is about the voters and about the, the Donald Trump effect, because if you say anything that would raise the hackles of Donald Trump, you are facing uncertain primary peril. Uh, so is that where we are permanently? Well, is this a blip? Trump, actually, you're right. Trump's a new phenomenon. He's different than the trend you talked about before was going on before Donald Trump showed up on the block, um, the d- division between the parties. What Trump has done is made it sort of a one-person rule. I mean, there is no Trumpism. Whatever he says goes. If he says he won fair and square in 2016, but he lost in 2020, his followers just say, yes, sir, yes, sir. No matter what he says, if he says, we're not, we're going to have protectionism, not free trade, they'll go, yes, sir. We're not going to worry about the deficit anymore. Yes, sir. In other words, these are changes from Republican philosophy. And he just makes the change and they go with him. I, I, the only way I can figure out Trump is that he hates the people that the Republicans hate. He doesn't have to be on best behavior. He can be a little odd, to put it lightly. But as long as he hates the people that they hate, um, he's popular with them. It's all negative with him. He's not for anything. Yeah, I still, I still have more questions about him, but I have to squeeze in, in, in a quick break. But I also want to uh, wedge in Ske- Stephen Colbert here because you once said to Stephen Colbert, I want to be a senator. It was 2010 when we oh, come back after the break. Come I want on, to- that's 21 years ago. I know, which is why the question is, when you come back from the break, you have to answer, is there any possibility you might want that again yeah. or still want you it are, or not want it at all? Don't- you are grabbing shamelessly for headlines. Shamelessly. Shamelessly. Thank you. No, I'm curious. I'm curious. I know it's a love of yours. So answer that when we come back. Welcome back. My guest tonight set the tone for a generation of politics and a generation of politicians. Chris Matthews is with me. And as I hear uh, that said aloud, sometimes I wonder if that's actually a compliment, Chris Matthews. But you said, uh, you know, back in 74, you ran for a U.S. House seat and you said to Stephen Colbert 10 years ago that you wanted to be a U.S. senator. So do you still is it still possible you might want to to get into politics on the other side of the uh, camera? We have aged, haven't we, in politics? I mean, all the people are, we know about who are running the show are uh, are pushing 80, and uh, if not into the 80s. Um, so I, but I, you know, I, I made my decision to stick with with journalism, and I still like to write. I've been writing since the 70s, really uh, writing for newspapers since the 80s. Speechwriter before that, I got all my all my jobs really from writing. And this latest book is the story of the writing and the writing of the inside stuff, the Berlin Wall coming down. I was there in South Africa when they had the first election. 
I've had an amazing chance for somebody who sort of thinks of himself as an outsider to be on the inside of history. And um, so uh, I have not lived in Pennsylvania really since I, before I went to college, I, I could go back, but I really wouldn't feel like a part of it. I know I have to tell you, I follow the politics up there. I still love Philly, Philadelphia. And I, uh, I feel, consider that my hometown. Um, so no, I'm not going to do it. I'm too old for that. Uh, but you know, I would love to have been a senator. I always thought that was the thing to do in American politics to be a U.S. senator. There's no doubt about it. Well, you're only 75, and that I mean that's ah. sort of the starting age for presidents now. <laughs> well, it is. Biden is in his late 70s. If he runs again, he'll be in his 80s. I mean, uh, Speaker Pelosi's in that age group. Uh, Steady Hoare, the majority leader. Uh, there are people that are just really robust. Somebody once said years ago, the difference between a politician, a good one, man or woman, is energy. Do you get up in the morning, do you jump out of bed, do you want to do it? Do you want to do it that day? You just want to do things. You don't, you run to you drop, basically. Uh, but I got to tell you, I don't know about your schedule, Ashley, but I got to tell you, when I was doing hardball every night, Monday through Friday, for all these years, by Friday night, I get, the, you know that weird thing is you're too tired to go to bed, so you want to stay up. So Kathleen and I would stay up and watch a movie or something and stay up till like one or something and get up on Saturday morning. And those men, especially, get up on Saturday morning and go play golf. I'm amazed at them. When it came to me, somebody go out and get a Starbucks, and that'll be what we do for activities in the morning. Uh, I don't know, but I, I worked and was tired every weekend. I was exhausted. So the, the show got to me. I don't know how. Somebody, one of my uh, agents wanted me to do live shows every Saturday night. It's in 26 city, 26 weekends They're around the country. I said, geez, you have, that will kill me. Um, so I worked hard enough. I still work. Yeah, it's not just the, it's not just the physical, it's the mental gymnastics that also take a, a toll, I think, throughout the week when you're, you're bouncing between breaking news and, you know, theorizing why some of the news is important, not just spitting out what it is, but why the news is happening. It, it, it takes its toll, which by the way, oh, by the way I want to just. Go ahead. I don't what? want to interrupt you now. Okay. I'm not interrupting you are you now. an interrupting chicken. You, I can't. I can't get a question out, which, by the way, I'm going to play a soundbite of you in a minute, interviewing guests and always answering their questions. But you, right off the, the front of the book, you dedicate um, this to the faithful fans of Hardball. For 20 years, we shared nightly quest for truth. You were always great company. You mentioned Kathleen, your wife, but you did the dedication to the to the viewers. She Tell me the decision. Ashley, she told your me. Wife. She said, do this Tell because you were talking about, you know, I'd meet a woman who's in her late age, late age, and she'd say, my husband watched it till the end. I mean, very close relationship with the people who watch us. You know, you, 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 don't, you don't see them, but they see you. They, and you are their company. I mean, Johnny Carson was my company for years when I come home from school on vacation or something. And um, I think we have to take that seriously. It's, it's two directional. And that's why I said when I left the show, January, February of last year, I said, it's not goodbye, but it's uh, till we meet again. And I hope to do see people again on occasion. Which I'm doing so right do now. you do you um, yeah and, and this is a different interview for you because you're answering the questions but when you were asking the questions I want to play this soundbite because I, I found it just it, it's just classic pugilistic you know Chris Matthews so you're interviewing Grover Nor Ashley I mean, Ashley you are overproduced you've got all these segments I don't know what's coming next you're you magic go, oh, you're television magic Chris Matthews and you're not in control now so young man you just sit back and listen uh, so this is you with Grover Norquist um, you're talking about you know obviously the debt ceiling I think this is back in 2011 and I I, I love this moment so I want to play it for uh, for everybody who may have missed it take a look I don't think the President of the United States is such a left-wing ideologue that he would close down the government because he's having a hissy fit that he can't get a tax increase. Uh, what, a hissy fit? Is that away. how we talk now? A hissy fit? What's that? Okay. That he's What's a hissy insisting, fit? What's a hissy fit? Um, when he says he wants to raise taxes and he'd rather close the government. You just said the President would rather close down the government. No, I'm saying to get a deal cut. between the Democrats and the Republicans. Everyone watching this show knows you need some kind of deal. I always loved the fact that you just um, you just said it like it was, um, but I also love the fact, Chris, that sometimes you just got exhausted by your guests and just answered the damn question for them. <laughs> well, you know what these terms come from: hissy fit, hysteria. You know the whole history of it. And uh, yeah, I just I caught him. I didn't like him, his language. Uh, so you know, I'm an opportunist in that regard. I. 
You know, I, I got Trump talking about abortion rights. He didn't understand it one time uh, on Green Bay during his running. And he talked about women needed to be punished if they choose to have an abortion. I go, what? Punished? What do you mean by that? He didn't know what he was talking about. He was saying it's pro-life. You know, I had one guy on talking about appeasement. I said, what was appeasement? Historically, what was appeasement? And uh, he didn't know. He was bluffing. He didn't know anything about history, this guy. I, I, you can usually can tell the person who comes on who doesn't know what the heck they're talking about. And it's fun to exploit that, exploit that for, the, for the person. Why. We're working for the yeah. audience. Uh, we're working for the Do person. Do you remember, you, just like when, uh, when I think Charlie Gibson asked Sarah Palin about the Bush Doctrine, and then he said, wait a minute, do you know what the Bush Doctrine is? And her answer, I think, was, uh, in what sense, Charlie? And, and it, was, it was huge. <laughs> it blows up big. Do you That's remember that moment? Cool. What a great it was, well, it was no, something else. I think it was Sean Gibson once that said to me in this business, which is apropos me, he said, you can be dead. Or maybe it was Harry Smith. One of the anchors said, in this business, you can be dead in a nanosecond. That's one reason for stress in this business is to make sure you don't say something wrong. It can be something that's taken as ethnic when it wasn't intended that way. It can be an absolute mistake of language. It can be you know, something Freudian, when you say something you're thinking about and you don't say it out loud, it can be anything, but you've, we're in live TV land. I was for 26 years, and uh, it's, a, it's a treacherous business. If you, if you just say, you can keep in the, your heart in the right place, but even if your heart's in the right place, some things will come out the wrong way. They do. Yeah, well, you know what? Like, I, I kind of feel like it's a, it's a minefield. Uh, comedians on stage, it's a minefield. Actors on the set, it's a minefield. People on television covering the news, it's a minefield. And then just, you know, having someone roll, you know, cell phone video on you in the Starbucks, it, it's a minefield. So that, that's why right. I kind of pushed you hard in the A block to just talk about this phenomenon that we're living through. Um, not to put you on the spot, but more to get the, the feeling of the person who's on the other end of it, you know. But I have to squeeze in a break, Matt, Chris, when we come back. I want to talk a little bit about, you know, Democrats and Republicans, their different styles, and why the hell it is that Democrats just keep eating their own. That's next. Chris Matthews is my guest tonight, and if you can name a job in politics, he's had it, he's wanted it, or he has covered it, or he has written about it. His new book is uh, This Country, My Life in Politics and History. There's like stuff about here about OJ, which I love, because now we're cross, you know, cross-sectioning between what I do for a living and, and what you do for a living. But now, Chris, uh, we're cross-sected again because uh, we, we're, we may very well have another trial of a century with, with you know, with Donald Trump, do you think he's going to be indicted? I don't know. I don't think it's fair to say something about that uh, if he's not indicted. If he is indicted, it's going to be serious. I just hope it's clear. I guess that would be my view. If, if they have something on him that's real and made sense to the American people, including his followers, that it's something they would consider wrong, criminal, felonious, and he's charged with it, and the evidence is there, well, that's probably good for the country that shows that Everyone's subject to the law. No one's above it. If it's complicated, if it seems bureaucratic or technical, I don't think that'd be very helpful to the country. I think it has to be a clear-cut case, like any case should be clear-cut, and uh, like the Chauvin case. I mean, clear-cut, and uh, people understand it and say, you know, darn it, this person's guilty and need, needs to be punished. I hope it's clear, clear. That's the one thing I want, clarity. So let me ask you this. And I always say, you know, from OJ to Casey Anthony to all of the, the you know, the, the even even Derek Chauvin, you can always pick a jury. But, you know, cable news um, and the Internet and Facebook and social media, the, just the relentless nature of all of these forces, I think it's getting harder and harder to do that. Or you're getting a jury that maybe isn't as pristine as it should be or as the juries once were. And that's why I really wonder about the Donald Trump case, if there's going to be one in Manhattan, if you think it's possible in the age of information and disinformation that we live in now, Chris, could we really find an appropriate jury uh, for Donald Trump if there's a need for one? 
Well, that would be a job. I can't imagine no one, I can't imagine anybody in America not knowing Donald Trump. I can't imagine anybody in America not having an opinion and an attitude toward him. That's pretty true. You're into something there. How can you find a person who's really neutral about the person himself, uh, not just the crime or the situation? Uh, there'll be those who are very pro-Trump and those who are very, very, very anti-Trump. And there'll be some, but think about it, where are those people come from, the ones who don't have a strong opinion? You're right. So if you're a defense attorney, you would try to find those jurors that were perhaps on the hard left or very much anti-Trump, and you try to expose that. But I'm not sure every potential juror is honest about that. Some people just want to be famous, and the chance to be famous is to be on a jury. You're, you're into it. I think this is a real challenge for Boydier, for the defense attorney, for the prosecution, to try to find people that have at least an open mind about the, the, the charge and can separate that from their politics and their sort of cultural attitude towards Trump. Because he's such an amazing, daunting force in American culture. It's hard to, to avoid having an opinion about him. I don't know anybody that's not having a, a strong opinion about him. I have two brothers that voted for him and two brothers that voted against him this time. And uh, that's fairly similar, typical in Pennsylvania, by the way, where I come from, where I come from, that that would be a pretty close call. Yeah, there, you, you were uh, alluding to the person who may not be honest in answering for dear. Those are called stealth jurors. They exist. They are real. And in the age of Trump, my feeling is that they would be more real than ever because he is so polarizing and some of his supporters are so angry. We now have allegations left and right about false flagging. So everybody, you know, is faking it and or at least alleging that people are faking who they are at, at these rallies. Please. I, you know, I for someone, you. I, you know, I want to say your age, but... Juries. What's that? I, here's my feeling. I remember the OJ case, which I covered for a year, two hours a night, on America's Talking. And we had uh, lawyers come in, criminal lawyers, who would come in on the show for free. And in the green room, where we were talking before the show, they would say, slam dunk, guilty as hell, OJ. Totally guilty, obviously. They'd get on this show, 180. And I figured out after a while this, I'd say, I get it. They're, they've got their, uh, their shingle up. Their shingle's up there. I want to defend you if you're in charge with a crime, a, a, a violent crime especially. I'm here to save you. So they don't want to be known as pro-prosecution. So they would come on and say, OJ's innocent after the green room saying he's guilty as hell. I, I, I know there's a problem of um, honesty here. I'm going to tell you. Gosh. Uh, you're pretty good. That, that's page 245. And the actual quote is, um, I have to assume they were hanging out their shingle. Potential clients are not looking for someone to dispense clear-eyed justice as much as they want someone to get them off. So it's, it's a great anecdote. I liked it because it was, again, in my wheelhouse. Uh, when we come back after the break, I have a question for you that we ask a lot of our guests, Chris. And it is, if you could sit down at a dinner table and the seat across from you is empty, who would you want to fill that empty seat for the hour? And it could be someone living or dead. It's called Table for Two. I'm going to mine you for that when we come back. Back with Chris Matthews. You know, Chris, one of the things I hear all the time um, from political watchers is that Republicans are very good at being a team and that Democrats are really good about fighting each other. Do you think that's ever going to change and does it need to? You know, the old headline is Democrats in disarray. I grew up with it. And Will Rogers, the great comedian, used to say, I belong to no organized political party. I'm a Democrat. And so it's always been the fact that it's a coalition party. It's not a party of unis, unified thinking. It had for years uh, the senators from the, uh, the old Confederacy, from the segregated states who were segregationists themselves, in the same party as Franklin Roosevelt and the New York liberals and the Philadelphia, Pennsylvania liberals. Uh, it's a party that has always been a coalition. I think uh, today it's a progressive uh, 50, maybe a bit more than 50% progressive, maybe a bit more, I think so. And, and some moderates, very few conservatives. Uh, I think it's a party that is united in the House very effectively by Nancy Pelosi, the Speaker. I've never seen discipline in the party ranks like she's been able to achieve. 
In the Senate, they have some holdouts, like uh, holdouts like Cinema from Arizona and uh, Joe Manchin. But no party, certainly not the Democrats, can rely on their marginal members to deliver victory for them because Joe Manchin's state, West Virginia, went by 40% for Trump, a big, huge margin of victory. If he were to go with the Democrats' program, Democrats' program entirely, he would probably be bounced. And then have be, and he'd be replaced by a ruby red Republican, a Trumpite. So I uh, mean, the fact of the matter is, the reason we have this division is that there are at least 21 states now that elect an all Republican ticket in the United States Senate. Therefore, you can't get 60 votes if you're a Democrat in the U.S. Senate because 40 some are already taken, and they're never going to be back in the Democratic fold as long as we're around. These states are conservative as heck, and they're going to elect conservative as heck Republican senators. And that's the way that Utah is not going to go liberal. The Dakotas are not going to go liberal. They're not. And uh, the same with uh, with uh, Idaho and Wyoming and most of the Deep South is staying the way it is. So you're going to see a problem with the filibuster for, for a long time. And the Democrats have got to figure out what can they get done when they don't need 60 votes. That means big fiscal changes like tax raises, uh, big spending programs, stimulus programs. They can do that. But they're not going to have much luck with getting bills changing uh, with minimum wage or voting rights or police police behavior uh, or immigration reform, because you need 60 votes to do those things. And if you want to change that, you need 50 votes at least to say, we're getting rid of the filibuster and they don't have those 50 votes. And why? that's why you know Joe Manchin becomes more and more important uh, every day and, and a name that will um, with, always, always be. If I, if I were Joe Biden, I'd be thinking every night with the smartest minds around me and the best intel people, what do they need in West Virginia in yeah. infrastructure? And I think that's, a, yeah. I, when I was working for Tip, I go into the enemy camp, I go to the, the local uh, chief engineer in the capital of the of opposition leaders and say, how many bridges are below a safety code? We got to fix those bridges. You got to do some intel. You got to find out what that senator needs. West Virginia under Bobby Byrd, the previous senator there, was known for all the pork barrel they brought into that state. All the government facilities transferred to West Virginia because of Bobby Byrd. Yeah. West Virginia still wants those federal dollars, maybe. Okay, so Chris, I'm going to do something fun now. It's the thing I teased before the break. It's the table for two. It usually gives me a lot of insight in, into my guests. Uh, we put you at a at a theoretical table for two. The table, or the seat across from you is empty. You can fill it with anybody you like, living or dead. Who would it be, your choice for that seat? I might say Ernest Hemingway for this reason. For this, I know his faults, but why did he make Africa seem wonderful to me? Why did he make Paris in the 20s seem wonderful to me? Why does he have this allure about bullfighting, which normally I would think I'd be aghast at? Why does he find this way to make you want to go where he's been? That, that sort of power, that Peter Pan power of his. What is that about? I'd like to, to get in, to sort of probe into that. Why is he so charismatic? And uh, as all, name another writer that can pair to him. And I'm a writer. Trying another a male or female writer whose dad carries maybe Jane Austen, I don't know. But everybody who writes wants to be or beat the legend of Ernest Hemingway. Well, it's a, it's a good way to end uh, a writer talking about another writer. Uh, Chris, the book is really good. I've been, uh, I've not finished it yet, but I've been getting through it as much as I can. It's called This Country, My Life in Politics and History, and this is one hell of a tour guide. Uh, Matthews, it's good to see you again. Glad we had this time together. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, it's great to see you. <laughs> doing this so much. <laughs> doing that work. Thank you so much.